Ähm, wir gehen jetzt über zum, zum Thema Komplex Staat und Familie, die Verbindungen zwischen den beiden Institutionen. Dazu wird uns Nasan Üstünder einen Beitrag leisten. Uh, first, so I would like to thank the organizers because I'm very happy to be here and I have already learned so much. And second, least, not least, but last, I would like to thank to the translators very much. And let's, yeah. Specifically Ergen. <laughs> okay. Uh, so one of the key elements of Öcalan's discussion of capitalist modernity and civilization is his critical analysis of the modern family and its relationship to capitalism and the nation state. My aim in this talk will be first to summarize Öcalan's approach and thoughts on the family, second, to discuss the practices of the Kurdish freedom movement and how these have affected the institution of the family, and finally, to open up certain questions in relation to the status of family in the political, moral society that should flourish with the construction of democratic modernity. A lot of these questions are surely going to be answered in practice. Still, I think, we should pose them intellectually as well in order to contribute to the ongoing international debates on themes like the organization of reproduction, love, intimacy, care, all of which are in related to the family. The patriarchal nature of the modern state is the object of extensive debate in feminist literature, literature. The idea that gender inequality is constitutive of modern citizenship and na the national community, as well as early and late capitalisms, has now become a common ground on which socialist, radical, and post-colonial feminists in different contexts engage in dialogue and contestation. While historical studies document that modernity, instead of enabling the liberation of women, has merely transformed the meaning of gender identities and hierarchies, sociological and anthropolo anthropological research show that such hierarchies are crucial in drawing the boundaries of the social, the economic, and the political, both materially and symbolically. Studies on women's bodies, on the other hand, document how the presentation and representation, inclusion and exclusion, care, disciplining, and violation of women's bodies are constitutive of modern power and state sovereignty. In his writings, Öcalan makes similar observations. According to Öcalan, women constitute the oldest colony, as Havin had mentioned yesterday, which has no determined borders. Moreover, he argues, while the colonization of women has started long ago, when matrilinearity was replaced by patrilinearity and patriarchy, it has taken its most exploitative form during capitalist modernity. The institution of the family plays a major role in this process. Family is where sexual and labor exploitation take place and rendered invisible through discourses of love, intimacy, motherhood, and femininity. It is also through the oppressive structures of family that the state and capitalism are produced and reproduced. When discussing the role the family plays in the colonization of women, 
Öcalan give re gives reference to four ways in which the family is linked to the stately and the accumulation and monopolization of capital. First, family is a microstate where man who monopolize means of violence and decision making rule over women. As such, family is the place where the stately anchors itself in society. Second, family is where women's labor is exploited and where women perform reproductive functions without any return. Three, the state makes women responsible for childbearing and raising, in other words, for the growth of the population through in the institution of the family. Four, the family natur naturalizes and normalizes oppression and slavery in society by its treatment of women. In sum, Öcalan argues that family is an ideology that constitutes the culture and materiality of capitalist modernity. Family is also the space where a war is waged against women. Enclosed in the family, women are both made into objects of unlimited pleasure through sexual exploitation and into slave labor through becoming mothers and housewives. Morality is replaced with law and politics by state, first within the family. Simultaneously, however, all these are made invisible by discourses of love, intimacy, and liberal individualism. Family then single-handedly constitutes the modern citizen who can function in a capitalist modern state and naturalizes oppression. While these are general assessments Öcalan makes about the modern family, he has more specific insights pertaining to the Kurdish family based on his own experiences and his ethnographic observations. As we know, a number of post-colonial feminists have criticized white feminism's objection to the family and argued that in context of colonialism and racism, the family might have an empowering role, providing its members with support and security. Öcalan, on the other hand, states that for obtaining freedom and free will, Kurdish youth has to separate itself from their families. According to him, Kurdish family not only su suffers from all the problems of the modern family, but in Kurdistan, family is also where colonialism and cooperation with the state is achieved. Families facilitate assimilation and internalization of colonized personalities. Joining the Kurdish freedom movement, and specifically the guerrilla movement is then, not only a way to resist the state and capitalism, but also the ideology of the family. Here I should add that according to Öcalan, family is not an institution that needs to be overcome, but an institution in need of a grand transformation. Only after this transformation will the family be able to perform its function of reproduction in a moral and political way. Until women became, become liberated and equal, Öcalan believes that sexuality and love will continue to be a relationship of domination. Hence the reason why the guerrillas and members of the freedom movement prefer voluntary celibacy. Although celibacy is not seen as a sacrifice, but rather an exercise of a political and moral individuality, it is nevertheless not demanded from the population, from the society. Instead, Kurdish movement's experience show that the pioneering role of the guerrilla and their ideas and practices 
change families directly and indirectly. Directly, the movement enacts change in consciousness and in gender relations through multiple political and pedagogical practices. Indirectly, change occurs through sons, daughters, brothers, sisters who join the guerrilla and disconnect themselves from the family. Since they do not reproduce themselves biologically, it is up to their family and friends to reproduce them by disseminating their ideas, deeds, memories. Yeah, memories. Okay. Now, ethnographic studies in Kurdistan have shown that the guerrilla movement has unsettled the institution of the family in other ways too. Women in general and fem female relatives of those who were killed during combat against the state in particular have become politically active, participate in civil society, and take public positions in municipalities and parliaments, leaving their husbands and sons, sons at home, hence challenge the division of labor at home in family. The campaign for education in mother tongue, on the other hand, highlighted women's role at home, since it is mostly women who exclusively speak in Kurdish because they weren't sent to school, and hence became less, less assimilated linguistically and culturally. In that sense, women's position in the family and in society have acquired a new value as agents who prevent the state et and ethnic colonialism from fully achieving their goal. Aside from changes in women's status within the family, a new generation of youth has emerged in Kurdistan who populate, populate the cities where in 1990s their families have been displaced by the Turkish army. These children have their own political communities and are agents of major insurgencies against the state. As a result, childhood in Kurdistan has emerged as a political status in which different age groups invest as a source of political and individual freedom. Despite all its negative effects then, we can say that the war in Kurdistan has resulted in a geography where nationalism, capitalism and the family systematically fail to be reproduced. Indeed, it is no surprise that, surprise that as elsewhere, since the beginning of 2000s, the Turkish state targeted the Kurdish family as its main unit of social policy and simultaneously punished women and children most severely. Social assistance programs, conditional ca cash transfer schemes, health reforms, social centers, schooling campaigns, low-cost public housing surrounded the Kurdish family and connected it intimately to the state. The then Prime Minister Erdogan urged mothers to properly educate their children and his then ally, the religious leader Fethullah Gülen, garnished Kurdistan with private schools and scholarships which would prepare students to the central university exams while also shaping their conducts. Meanwhile, as a result of anti-terror laws, children participating in public protests, protests and women members of the freedom movement were arrested and sentenced to long years of prison. prison. When the Justice and Development Party started the peace process, it is no surprise that the first martyrs of peace were Sakina Johnson and her two friends. Since Johnson was a founding member of PKK and the leader of the mov woman, movements of liberation, the next martyr would be Medeni Yildirim, a teenager protesting the building of an army post in his hometown.
During the peace process, the Prime Minister Erdogan have numerous times declared that peace would open up Kurdistan to capital investment and accumulation while war was making it uncanny for capital. He also admitted mistakes done in the past by the state and declared his willingness to include Kurdish history to the national narrative by making reference to Kurdish historical figures like Ahmed Ahani, Shivan Perver and Said Nursi. Nursi. Finally, repeating the slogan, mothers shouldn't cry anymore again and again, he underlined the importance of intimate bonds and tried to reduce the guerrilla movement into a narrative of family tragedy. Indeed, the peace of the state is always one where territory made uncanny bar by war is redefined and secured, where multiple histories are assimilated into one national history, and where the social is reorganized as a homogeneous unity. Thereby, the moral and political society, which found an outlet by capitals and states' loss of power during one war, is once again dominated by law and state. Indeed, it is, again, it is no surprise, right after the peace process was declared, uh, JDP, the government, started building roads, dams, and other construction projects in order to privatize Kurdistan's commons, built new army posts in order to nationalize it, and try to re-establish family, and thereby what Öcalan would call its little state cells by means of social policy. However, the Kurdish movement was prepared, and Öcalan had developed a new paradigm to fight against all of this, single-handedly, by mobilizing the movement towards what we now call the construction process. That is the building of the institutions of democratic autonomy and modernity in spite of the state. Öcalan argues that the family is key to the building of the moral and political society that will flourish with democratic autonomy as a result of the construction process. Now I'm going to skip a whole section where I uh, talked about uh, yeah, I try to compare uh, Öcalan's theory of family with uh, mainstream Western theory, critiques of family, but I'm just skipping it. So just final to conclude. It is not easy to implement policies that will reform family, that will, and that will produce intimacies of equality. Rojava, as in other parts of Kurdistan, in Rojava, as in other parts of Kurdistan, there are different institutions working toward this, and different forms of labor exist that go into the making of alternative intimacies. People's houses, women's houses, political parties, or women's organizations are a few of these institutions. These institutions face a lot of questions on the ground that they might respond, that they have to respond, respond quickly and in practice. For example, how to address violence, incest, polygamy, what about divorce, inheritance? To, how can women organize autonomous self-defense units against men, against families? How can children organize self-defense against adults in the context of state violence? How can one acquire access to goods and resources without being a member of a nuclear family? To what extent is family still a place that protects people from liberal individualism? How can other institutions like assemblies, academies, and communes become strong and encompassing enough to change families? The hope is that as these institutions become functional, new forms of intimacy based on guerrilla's own experience of friendship 
will flourish and hence models for different forms of intimacy multiplied. Thank you. Vielen Dank.